of the message today is Satan's schemes, but God's answers. And you know how everybody says uh, you've got the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, you got those three things. But, you know, I've thought about that a lot. I'm not so sure that's accurate because, you know, really it's just the world and the flesh. The devil is behind all of it. So he's really the one that's orchestrating it. So I don't know that there are three separate entities that are out to get us. I think Satan's at the top of the food chain there. He's at the, the head of the org chart for evil, and then it's, you know, and then all these other tactics and, and, and ways, you know, come, come back to haunt us. Uh, but um, he comes as an angel of light, right? Why does he do that? For the purposes of deception, he comes as an angel of light. Sometimes he comes as a roaring lion. Why is that? For the purposes of destruction. And so he has a lot of tools in his, in his tool belt, a lot of... Uh, Arrows in his quiver, so to speak, and he's not afraid to use them, whatever works. However, he needs to manipulate people and places and things to get what he wants. So I guess then the question is, uh, you know, what does he want and, and what are his goals? Well, first of all, he hates God. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Second of all, he hates us. We belong to God, so it makes sense that he'd hate us, and he does. He is trying in his, I guess, his warped way of looking at things to maybe think he can defeat God. You know, it's, it's, it's a long shot. He knows it. But he's still playing out that string. But we know he was defeated at the cross, right? That's why everybody says that. That's why the theologians say Satan was defeated at the cross. He was because he tried everything he could to keep Jesus from being born. And then when Jesus was born, he tried to do everything he could to keep him from going to the cross, but he failed. Over and over and over again, he failed. And so when Jesus took our sins upon himself and people were redeemed, that major plot, that major thing that Satan was trying to accomplish was dead and gone forever. So now... He can't really defeat God, so now all he do, he's doing is playing for a stalemate. Or he's trying to forestall the inevitable. He knows his days are short. He's on a rampage. He's going to do whatever he can to play out the string, to keep stopping the clock, you know, whatever he's going to do. Uh, but eventually, it's going to come to the end for him. And no matter what he does, you know, God has him boxed in and, and, and his moves. Because a lot of times people may say, well, if Satan knows the Bible so well, why is he going to fall right into God's plan, what God says he's going to do? Why? Because God is boxing him in in that way. He's forced to do it. There's no other way he can try to outsmart God. So he's, he's inevitably and predictably going to do those things that, um, that he thinks we're going, are, are going to help him win uh, but that will ultimately lead to his, his utter defeat. So who's, who's the first? And I guess the point of this is, too, is that, you know, we have work to do, right? We have work to do on the earth to serve God. And he's going to try to paralyze us. He's going to try to stop us. He's going to try to do things that force us into a state of being inert, where we can't do what God wants us to do. So he has all these tactics and things of that nature. Well, what, what, one of the things he does is he attacks the body. And I'm talking not, not necessarily the physical body, although I suppose you know, that can be something to consider too. But I'm talking about the body of Christ. So the first thing he's going to try to do is to prevent people from getting saved. Okay? He's going, so, and what I'll do here is I'm going to make some, some presentations about his tactic and then how God fixes it, how God responds to it, and what the ultimate outcome is going to be. So I think he can try to prevent people from getting saved in the first place. That's why, you know, you see all these things that are just such lies, such fairy tales that are presented, you know, with, you know, Darwinism and all that stuff. I don't want to go down that road again. I, I go down it quite a bit. So, but you know what I mean. So he's going to do everything he can to distract people who aren't saved, to keep them from getting saved. But you know why he's going to lose? Because God's not going to let that happen. That's the thing we have to understand, folks, is that the only person who's going to be responsible for not being saved is the individual person. Okay? You know, 
Because the Bible says that we are without excuse as we stand before God at judgment day. We're without excuse. Well, if, if somebody can go up and do the Flip Wilson thing and say, the devil made me do it. The devil made me this way. Well, then, it, then it's an excuse. It's a contradiction of Scripture. The only person that's going to keep you from heaven is you. Because God has made that... Pre- yeah, Satan's going to do all these distracting things. He's going to do all these, these lies. He's going, to, he's going to do all these things to prevent you from getting there. But ultimately, it's going to come down to you being face-to-face with that decision. And whether you say yes or you say no. And so, if anybody out there, and God knows the heart, He knows the heart of every person, God's never going to be in a situation where He says, well, hey, you know, I know this this, uh, person over here. If they just knew the truth, they'd be saved. Because I know that they would would say yes to me. They would say yes to my son and what I've given to pay for their sins. But it's too bad they got all this clutter in front of them. They're never going to know. Oh, it's too bad. No. We have a sovereign God we worship. We have an omnipotent, omnipresent God. And he knows. And he's not going to let anything stand in the way of that. People themselves, because it's an individual decision. We don't get saved as groups. We don't get lost as groups. It's an individual thing. So he can attack the body of Christ in that way by trying to prevent its numbers from being added to. All right? But the other way he attacks the body is to try to weaken the church. Right? He tries to weaken the church. And that's so obvious. I mean, we don't even, I don't even know how many more examples we can give of the church being corrupted and, and people turning away from essential doctrine. But, I mean, here, here are a couple of quick verses. Where's my glasses? In Galatians 1, in verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you, we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. So it's repeated twice. The Lord's trying to get a message across. And when they say a different gospel, it's not just, you know, the good news of Jesus Christ being our Savior. It's the Bible. That's the good news, the whole Word of God. And so we see today, we see all sorts of uh, efforts to to undermine God's true word by people picking and choosing what they're going to believe, what they're not going to believe, uh, instead of adhering to it. So that's one example. There's a lot more, but I'll also read Second Peter uh, chapter Second Peter two, verse one. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Okay, there's a lot more verses like that in the Bible we could go down, folks, that we could look at. But Satan, one of his efforts is to weaken the church, to make the church ineffective. That way, again, it forestalls his ultimate demise. That's the game, okay? Uh, So, those are his schemes What's the fix? What is the fix for that? Well, the fix for that would be, first of all, I think 2 Peter uh, 2 1, where, no, no, that's the wrong one, I'm sorry. Um, 2 Timothy 3 16, sorry, where the Bible talks about all of God's word, Old and New Testament, being breathed out by God. It is spiritually, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is the Word of God from start to finish. Okay, so that's what we start with. That is the foundation we start with as believers, is that the entire Bible is the Word of God. Okay, and when we have that in mind, then we have to start looking at it and say, well, what does it say? Do we have the right to go in and say, well, I believe that part, but I don't think that's right. Or, you know, this is convenient here, but this isn't. Uh, This is culturally acceptable now, but it wasn't then, so we don't have to deal with it. Okay? Um, Understand the context of what Scripture is teaching. And 
again, when we know that, then we can go into uh, the next verse, which would be Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, where we put on the full armor of God. That's how we, as a body of Christ, defeat Satan as he tries to weaken the church, okay? So knowing, knowing it's the word of God, and then once we know that, then putting on the full armor of God and understanding that we wrestle against principalities and powers. We, we wrestle against Satan. This is what he's trying to do. So we put on the entire armor of God, which is so much having to do with the Bible, and that is how we defeat Satan's scheme. It's Christ who's doing it, but at the same time, uh, it's his word. That's the way we defeat that scheme. I think it was interesting. I think it was Jacob Prosh who talked about this a long time ago, but he said that um, you know when the Romans would put on their, uh, their battle gear, what was the first thing they put on? The belt. Everything hooked onto the belt. And what does Paul call the belt? He calls it the belt of truth. The Bible, the belt of truth. And so that is amazing. It's an amazing insight as far as I'm concerned because what he, what he said was basically is that it starts there. Everything hooks on to the truth of God's word, and that's where we start. So, okay, so part of his scheme is to go after people who aren't saved, to weaken the church, but then he also makes attacks on the individual. He makes attacks on the individual. Uh, what is one of the things that he does? He uses temptation and sin. Temptation followed by sin. That's a big distraction. That'll keep people from growing in Christ. That'll keep people from accomplishing God's, uh, his, his plans. Again, God's plans are never going to be ultimately thwarted. They're never going to be, but they can get derailed. Uh, you know, they can be delayed, I suppose, because of what we are doing or not doing as a church and what evil people are doing, and, you know, so it's how we fight against that. Um, but temptation and sin is a big problem. And, and, and who, what's the obvious, the obvious thing? Is David and Bathsheba, right? Or David, you know, I should say, should say that to start off with. What David did was not unforgivable. I mean, he was, he was, was forgiven, but it was terrible. And what he did was, it caused such a problem for him and his family and the nation of Israel and so many other things because of what he did. And so Satan had some success there. It wasn't ultimate, it was temporary, but still Satan had some success because he put all that out there, but David walked headlong into it. And why did he walk headlong into it? Because he had gotten lazy. He had gotten a little bit, you know, taking things for granted. Hey, these victories are coming easy. God's doing it all. Okay, cool. And he got, he got a little... His mind got a little idle, okay? And so he was ripe for the taking. And we talked about this several months ago uh, in another sermon, but, you know, he had so many opportunities. You know, when he saw Bathsheba out there and she was, you know, bathing or whatever she was doing, um, you know, he, he could have walked away at several different points. He could have said, whoa, hey, you know, Better get my, my act together here and just, you know, not go down that road, okay? His lust still would have been wrong, but at the very least, it could have been nipped in the bud. But he kept looking. He kept, he kept, he kept at it. And then, then he summoned her. But he could have said, hey, you know, no, 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 no. This, what am I doing? Am I crazy? I'm not going to do this. But he took that next step, and then the next step, and the next step, and the next step. And so Satan had some partial success there. It wasn't permanent. It wasn't eternal. But he can thwart all of us by leading us down that road of temptation and sin. Ananias and Sapphira would be another example. So what's the fix? What is God's fix for this temptation that is out there? Well, first of all, to be prepared on the front end, you know, don't be lazy in your faith. 
you know. Don't be lazy in your faith. Don't take things for granted. You know, fill your minds. And again, I, folks, i got to tell myself this as much as I'm telling you. I'm not preaching from an ivory tower here, so don't misunderstand. But we have to fill our minds with things that are good, things that are productive. Uh, you know, because otherwise, it, it kind of is true, you know, the idle mind is a devil's workshop. I mean, it's not, a, it's not in the Bible anywhere that I know of. Uh, probably next to the same place where it says cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> but at the same time, there is a ring of truth to that, is there not? Second opinions? Oh, okay. Uh, so, I mean, but we, we can fall victim by letting our minds stray or not be filled with the things of God, to be filled with things that are good, you know, um, Whatever that may be, you know, and I've used the example before, you know, I get on my phone and I start playing Scrabble on my phone. Is that a sin? Of course not. But does it become a problem if that's, if that's all I'm doing? Absolutely. That's a problem. You know, I mentioned uh, a few years back where, is golfing a sin? I sure hope not. <laughs> but, you know, when you get to the point where it's consuming you, you know, to where... Uh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do better. I'm going to go out tomorrow. And if I don't do it then, then I go out the next day. And it starts to become an idol. That, that's where it becomes sinful. So you've got to keep your, even watching a good movie or a TV show, none of that's sinful. But it's when you have it be the rule, you know, rather than the exception, or when it rules your life instead of it being just a harmless distraction or something. So, um... So we got to be prepared on the front end for when that temptation comes, to be praying, to be in the Word of God, so that when it does come, you are strengthened, you are heartened in the Lord. And uh, that'll be a, a big help. And I think then the second thing is, don't be so prideful that you don't go to God and get the problem fixed. You know, that's another problem that David had. You know, he sat on this sin for over a year, I think it was. Now, eventually he went and he repented and he got saved and everything. But don't be so prideful that you don't go to the Lord to be forgiven or that you're so ashamed that you don't be forgiven because you... I, I, I can't, I can't. No. <laughs> you got to be prepared on the front end. And then on the back end, you have to go to the Lord, confess your sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what you have to do. Now, I can't guarantee that the sins that we commit won't have effects down the road, okay? I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, some, I, sometimes they're, you know, they're minor. You know, sometimes, like, the, again, the David Bathsheba thing, that's pretty, pretty big stuff. I mean, that's, that, that was a big-time ripple effect. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, and it just kept snowballing, right? So, um, so those, that's the fix. Satan has the temptation and the sin that's out there that he wants you to get into. But the fix is to try to be prepared on the front end. Don't let your mind get distracted. Don't let Satan build a beachhead in your life. But then when you do fall, go to the Lord. Go to him fast. Go to him with sincerity. Okay? All right, so the next thing that, um, that Satan's going to try to do to, um, to go after us is to... Uh, distract us. And in and the, and the, and the, and the verses that I pulled out of that today were from um, Nehemiah. Uh, Satan will use distraction and discourage. Well, I shouldn't say distraction. I meant to say discouragement because uh, we already talked about distraction. So discouragement. Uh, you ever get so discouraged, it's like, man, I give up. I give up. You know, Anybody who's trying to sell a house or buy a house knows what that's all about because that's what we're going through right now. We were this close. We missed it by that much. We did the church too, really, you know, of, of selling our house and, and getting a, a new house that, is, that we all would have been, you know, rough room for us. And it just as quick as it came, boom, it was gone. As good as this thing sounded with this, uh, this new building at Menard, as soon as it was there, boom, didn't work, all right? And so that discouragement 
can lead to frustration and, you know, inactivity. And then what happens when you're inactive? Then you got the temptation and the sin that comes back in. So it's really, uh, uh, there's not one of these things that's isolated from another because no matter what thing Satan does, it can start to metastasize into other things that then continue to cause problems. But um, in Nehemiah, they were instructed to rebuild the temple. And, uh, and this is the verse now when... Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was enraged and jeered at the Jews. And he said, in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for uh, themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones and the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Hmm? Oh, yes, Nehemiah 4, 1 through 4. So, Adrian Rogers put it this way. He said, you know, these people were worn out. They were weighed down, and they were wrought out. They got in the middle of this thing. They looked, how much longer is it going to take us to finish this Look at how far we've got. We've got nowhere. And look how so much we have to do. Look at this mess. It's like when Christy and I, you know, several years ago, we had that old pool that was, it was an in-ground pool, but it was, it was, you know, it was falling apart. It was, and we tried to get people to come out and, you know, and, and tr take it out, you know, to take out the pool, you know, because it had, because it had steel walls and all this stuff, so you had to, uh, you know, the village said you had to clear it all out. So we said, by gosh, we're going to do it ourselves. So we rented jackhammers. And the two of us are out there. <laughs> Christy, how you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> we were at it for four hours. And we looked at each other and we're going, are you kidding me? <laughs> We had like one section of one five-foot area that still wasn't done, and we spent forever and a day just getting that. Plus, we had headaches. Our bones were still rattling. It was like the cartoon. I'm serious. It was like in Bugs Bunny, you know, where we'd walk along, and, you know, and then we'd <laughs> take a few more steps, and the same thing would happen. So, you know, it was just, it was so aggravating, it was so frustrating, it was so discouraging. We put all this time and effort, and look at how far we are. We're nowhere. This is what the Jews were going through. So in that way, they were, they were worn out. They, it, they looked at the mess around them. Uh, folks, again, I'm relating a lot of things to what we just experienced selling our building. And thank God, literally, that people stepped up. I mean, Mark was, was phenomenal, and... Uh, Mike, Sam, and Dan were tremendous uh, it, it just stepping in there and, you know, and getting it done. Because you look and you go, this, this is unreal. We are never going to get this place cleared out. And it's, it was discouraging, you know. Uh, when we got back from vacation and I went into the office and I started going through all those papers and everything, I said, this is... You know, so I, I mean, on a, on, a, on a smaller scale, I can understand what the Jews were experiencing there. And, uh, and Kathy, I, I, you know, I should have mentioned at the last service, you know, you've done a phenomenal job taking care of that church, too. I mean, Randy, with the, the maintenance of it, but you with the lawn and the, and the decorations and Christmas and Easter and, you know, so I, 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 I meant to, and then I got distracted, so. Um, but anyway... But what happened was, the good news was, we did get it done and had, you know, great help and people who stepped up and, you know, and, 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 and jumped in and offered and everything else. So, um, but they were, uh, but, the, but the people of Israel then, again, they were, they were worn out. They were, they were weighed down with, what's the purpose of all this, you know, and, and how, we're nowhere, we're nowhere. 
They were getting made fun of. They were getting teased. They were getting, you know, laughed at. And sometimes Satan will use not only the world to do that, but sometimes even people right in your own circle, you know. You know, they'll turn on you. You know, and then, and then you're looking and it's like, well, and look what happened when the Jews came out of Egypt. You know, they were trying to do something, follow God, and then they started getting the griping and the, we should have, Moses, we should have stayed where we were. What's the matter with you? So you start getting turned on by people in your own group. And this is what I wanted to say, and I, I was looking forward to this. Folks, you guys have been amazing. Because I don't complain about, you know, <clears throat> it's a privilege for me to do what I do at the church. It just is. I mean, I, I, it's just, it, it is. I, I, I'm, it's not a job for me. But this was a lot to go through, and then, you know, trying to, you know, get us someplace else. And when I sent the text out about meeting at this place, the way everybody just, you know, jumped in and was excited, you, I can't tell you what that did for me. So I just want to thank every one of you. I mean that because, you know, it's like, okay, people aren't, they haven't lost interest. They haven't said, eh, we don't have a building anymore. Um, yeah, maybe I'll show up. It wasn't that at all. You were so fast to jump in, and we're so, you know, I'm sure we don't agree on everything, but on, on the big stuff, man, I tell you, the way that all of you folks have, you know, come together and, um, and really just even without, because I sent those things out individually. I didn't, nobody else saw really what anybody else sent, and you were all of the same mind on that, and that made things easier too. So, um, so, so Satan will use discouragement to try to make us inert. And this was the plea of Nehemiah. Hear, or, hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are the captives. Do not cover their guilt and do not blot their sins out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So... Satan partially succeeded there. Again, it was, uh, if it was just for a season. It was just for a time. But what was the fix? Well, with God's inspiration, Nehemiah led them. First of all, they had to arm themselves for battle, literally. You know, so they, they had, did have that, you know, where they were getting ready to, to battle. Um, but they were assured who they belonged to. They were assured who they belonged to. We belong to the Creator. We belong to the Lord. Not to the, you know, as much as I love this country, we don't, you know, we don't, we're, we're not beholden to the government, you know, we're, we don't, we don't have, you know, let our lives rise or fall or fail or succeed because of who the president is, um, you know, or who the pastor is for that matter. You know, we, it's all, who do we belong to? We belong to the living God. Okay, and that is something that Nehemiah reminded them of as a fix to Satan's schemes. Who do you belong to? You belong to the Lord God. Remember that. And then the next thing, so in addition to arming and reminding them who they belong to, they were given perspective. They were saying, hey, this building that you're building, this isn't just a building. This is the temple you're rebuilding. There's a, there's a reason this temple is here. The sacrifices are there for a reason. It's pointing to something. Who's it pointing to? It's pointing to Jesus Christ, who's been promised way back in Genesis 3.15. So Nehemiah, with the Lord's guidance, gave the people perspective, which is what we need to have. We need to have that eternal perspective. Why are we doing what we're doing? It's not an end in and of itself. It is for the purposes of, of building up each other for you know, educating, leading people to Christ, being more equipped for what we believe and being able to defend the faith and so forth. Uh, then they were told to get back to work. So they had, who do you belong to? Okay. What's the ultimate perspective involved here? All right, now get back to work. <laughs> okay. So now with that, get back to work. That's what they were told. Uh, and they were unified before God, just as I, I, I believe we are here. We're unified before the Lord God. And then finally, uh, they were warned to be careful about sin. You know, be careful with sin. Don't mess with it. 
Don't toy with it because it's, it's dangerous, <laughs> okay? All right, let, we're going to wrap it up now. But finally, um, the other thing that Satan does to try to paralyze believers is by guilt and accusation. Uh, he is known as the slanderer. He is known as the accuser of the brethren. And so sometimes, even when we're not guilty of a particular thing, he will slander. Okay, he will slander, uh, but then times we are guilty of things, okay? And that's where he's the accuser. I don't know why he does it. I, 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 I think I know why Satan still is the accuser of the brethren, because even though he's a fallen angel, to say the least. He's the greatest angel and had the greatest fall. But he's still self-righteous. You know? He still bears the image of a created being of God. And so, you know, what he's about doing is there is still sort of a, a pride about him and where he wants to feel better about himself. So he'll point out all of you. See, all these people you love, God, look what they're doing. Look what they're doing. So in that sense, he's the accuser of the brethren. This is from uh, Zechariah chapter 3. And I was listening to uh, R.C. Sproul yesterday. It was, he gave a beautiful talk on this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he gave vestments. Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by, and I love this, and the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua. So the high priest, the clothes he was supposed to wear were supposed to be of such a variety to reflect the glory of God and to show that beauty and reflect God's glory, his beauty, his magnificence. And so this priest, the high priest, shows up with all these dirty clothes on, just the opposite effect. So Satan's going to use that to accuse. He's going to use that to, to, to paralyze, to you know, make himself feel better, I suppose. Uh, this could be applied, I think, in, in some way to the cross because when we are sinful and we're saved, you know, the dirty rags that we have, that we wear, the filth and the sin that we have, we are given the righteousness of Christ. We are given the righteousness of the King, not because of anything we've deserved, but because of His grace. So it does apply to someone being saved, but I think what it's talking about here are believers. It's talking about people, I mean, the high priest, he was already a believer. And Satan is there to accuse him, and God rebukes him and says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? This is somebody I've chosen. This is somebody who's saved. You're not going to accuse them, Satan, and get away with it. I'm going to do that. I'll take care of it. This is someone I have who's been dirty because the brand, the thing that was in the fire, is all full of soot and ashes and grime. And God says, I have pulled him out. He belongs to me, not you. And so, in that beautiful exchange, we see that even when we fall, as believers, God wants to forgive us. We need to go to Him. So, those are the schemes of the devil, the fix. The magnificent work of the Holy Spirit would be the first thing. I mean... Satan is there to accuse you, to, to make you feel guilty, to have it harbor and fester away, and to let it be something that carries on through your life, that causes you to stumble, that causes you to be inactive, that causes you not to serve the Lord. 
The Holy Spirit comes and can convict you too. The Holy Spirit comes and says, hey, this was wrong. But what is the Holy Spirit trying to do to believers? The Holy Spirit is trying to take and look at believers and say, I want to correct you. I'm going to let you know, but I want to correct you. I want to perfect you. Why? Because I love you, and I've got things for you to do, and you've got an ultimate home in heaven. You see the difference between the accuser of the brethren and the Holy Spirit? Both are acknowledging our sin. Both are acknowledging how we've fallen and so so on and so forth. But then to offer just that great love and nurturing for a reason, not just for the sake of accusation. Um, So that's one of the fixes, the work of the Holy Spirit when Satan is trying to accuse us. Uh, The faithfulness of God. You know, God is faithful even when we're not. Uh, You know, God's grace extends and he understands our situation. But we need to go to him and repent of our sins. Uh, We also need to be assured of our salvation. That would be the third item on this list that is a fix against Satan's schemes in that way. Know that you are saved. It's a command of God, by the way, that we know we're saved. We're not supposed to be walking around wondering, am I really saved? Did I do enough? When is God going to pull the rug out from under me? No. He wants you to know you're saved so you can do the work that he set out for you to do. Amen? And then the unparalleled work of Jesus on the cross. That's what it always comes back to, folks. It starts there. We're not here if Jesus doesn't go to the cross. We're not learning any of this. We're not, we're not t- called to do any of these things, to serve, to uh, do anything unless Jesus goes to the cross and takes our sins. And then when we believe, he gives us his perfect righteousness. We're not here. We have no future other than a grim one. Uh, We have no hope of heaven, but because of God's love through Jesus Christ, we have all this in abundance. Our cup truly does run over in that sense. We're filled to the brim because of the salvation we possess, and then everything else is just a bonus, and the cup runs over, and the cup runs over. So uh, those are the schemes of Satan, but God has the answers. We just need to embrace those answers, and it's going to make... It's not going to make every problem go away, but we are going to persevere a lot better as we await the day we see him face to face. Amen. Let's stand and pray.